The following booklet is called Around the Wicket Gate by C.H. Spurgeon. Preface. Millions of men are in the outlying regions far off from God and peace. For these we pray and to these we give warning. But just now we have to do with the smaller company who are not far from the kingdom, but have come right up to the wicket gate which stands at the head of the way of life. One would think that they would hasten to enter, for a free and open invitation is placed over the entrance. The porter waits to welcome them, and there is but this one way to eternal life. He that is most loaded seems the most likely to pass in and begin the heavenward journey, but of what ails the other men? This is what I want to find out. Poor fellows, they have come a long way already to get where they are, and the king's highway, which they seek, is right before them. Why do they not take to the pilgrim road at once? Alas, they have a great many reasons, and foolish as those reasons are, it needs a very wise man to answer them all. I cannot pretend to do so. Only the Lord himself can remove the folly which is bound up in their hearts, and lead them to take the great decisive step. Yet the Lord works by means, and I have prepared this little book in the earnest hope that he may work by it to the blessed end of leading seekers to an immediate simple trust in the Lord Jesus. He who does not take the step of faith, and so enter upon the road to heaven, will perish. It will be an awful thing to die just outside the gate of life, almost saved, but altogether lost. This is a most terrible of positions. A man just outside Noah's Ark would have been drowned, A man slayer close to the wall of the city of refuge, but yet outside of it, would be slain. And a man who is within a yard of Christ, and yet has not trusted him, will be lost. Therefore am I in terrible earnest to get my hesitating friends over to the threshold. Come in, come in, is my pressing entreaty. Wherefore standest thou without, is my solemn inquiry. May the Holy Spirit render my pleadings effectual with many who shall glance at these pages. May he cause his own almighty power to create faith in the soul at once. My reader, if God blesses this book to you, do the writer this favor. Either lend your own copy to one who is lingering at the gate, or buy another and give it away. For his great desire is that this little volume should be of service to many thousands of souls. To God this book is commended, for without his grace nothing will come of all that is written. C.H. Spurgeon, Awakening Great numbers of persons have no concern about eternal things. They care more about their cats and dogs than about their souls. It is a great mercy to be made to think about ourselves and how we stand towards God in the eternal world. This is full often a sign that salvation is coming to us. By nature we do not like the anxiety which spiritual concern causes us and we try like sluggers to sleep again. This is great foolishness, for it is at our peril that we trifle when death is so near and judgment is so sure. If the Lord has chosen us to eternal life, he will not let us return to our slumber. If we are sensible, we shall pray that our anxiety about our souls may never come to an end, till we are really and truly saved. Let us save from our hearts he that suffered in my stead, shall my physician be. I will not be comforted till Jesus comfort me. It would be an awful thing to go dreaming down to hell, and there to lift up our eyes with a great gulf fixed between us and heaven. It will be equally terrible to be aroused to escape from the wrath to come, and then to shake off the warning influence, and go back to our insensibility. I notice that those who overcome their convictions and continue in their sins are not so easily moved the next time. Every awakening which is thrown away leaves a soul more drowsy than before, and less likely to again be stirred to holy feeling. Therefore our heart should be greatly troubled at the thought of getting rid of its trouble in any other way than the right way. One who had the gout was cured of it by a quack medicine which drove the disease within, and the patient died. To be cured of distress of mind by a false hope would be a terrible business. The remedy would be worse than the disease. Better far that our tenderness of conscience should cause us long years of anguish than that we should lose it and perish in the hardness of our hearts. Yet awakening is not a thing to rest in or to desire to have lengthen out month after month. If I start up in a fright and find my house on fire, I do not sit down at the edge of the bed and say to myself, I hope I am truly awakened. Indeed, I am deeply grateful that I am not left to sleep on. 
No, I want to escape from threatened death. And so I hasten to the door or to the window that I may get out and may not perish where I am. It would be a questionable boon to be aroused and yet not to escape from the danger. Remember, awakening is not salvation. A man may know that he is lost and yet he may never be saved. He may be made thoughtful and yet he may die in his sins. If you find out that you are bankrupt, the consideration of your debts will not pay them. A man may examine his wounds all the year round and they will be none the nearer being healed because he feels their smart and notes their number. It is one trick of the devil to tempt a man to be satisfied with the sense of sin, and another trick of the same deceiver to insinuate that the sinner may not be content to trust Christ, unless he can bring a certain measure of despair to add to the Savior's finished work. Our awakenings are not to help the Savior, but to help us to the Savior. To imagine that my feeling of sin is to assist in the removal of the sin is absurd. It is as though I said that water could not cleanse my face unless I look longer in the glass, and it counted the smuts upon my forehead. A sense of need of salvation by grace is a very healthful sign, but one needs wisdom to use it aright and not to make an idol of it. Some seem as if they had fallen in love with their doubts and fears and distresses. You cannot get them away from their terrors. They seem wedded to them. It is said that the worst trouble with horses when their stables are on fire is that you cannot get them to come out of their stalls. If they would but follow your lead, they might escape the flames, but they seem to be paralyzed with fear. So the fear of the fire prevents their escape in the fire. Reader, will your very fear of the wrath to come prevent your escaping from it? We hope not. One who had long been in prison was not willing to come out. The door was open, but he pleaded even with tears to be allowed to stay where he had been so long. Fond of prison, wedded to the iron bolts and the prison fare. Surely the prisoner must have been a little touched in the head. Are you willing to remain an awakened one and nothing more? Are you not eager to be at once forgiven? If you would tarry in anguish and dread, surely you too must be a little out of your mind. If peace is to be had, have it at once. Why tarry in the darkness of the pit wherein your feet sink in the miry clay? There is light to be had, light, marvelous, and heavenly. Why lie in the gloom and die in anguish? You do not know how near salvation is to you. If you did, you would surely stretch out your hand and take it, for there it is, and it is to be had for the taking. Do not think that feelings of despair would fit you for mercy. When the pilgrim on his way to the wicked gate tumbled into the slough of despond, do you think that when the foul mire of that sluice stuck to his garments it was a recommendation to him to get him easier admission at the head of the way? It is not so. The pilgrim did not think so by any means, neither may you. It is not what you feel that will save you, but what Jesus felt. Even if there were some healing value in feelings, they would have to be good ones, and the feeling which makes us doubt the power of Christ to save and prevents our finding salvation in him is by no means a good one, but a cruel wrong to the love of Jesus. Our friend has come to see us, and has traveled through our crowded London by rail or tram or omnibus. On a sudden he turns pale. We ask him what is the matter, and he answers, I have lost my pocketbook, and it contained all the money I have in the world. He goes over the amount to a penny and describes the checks, bills, notes, and coins. We tell him that it must be a great consolation to him to be so accurately acquainted with the extent of his loss. He does not seem to see the worth of our consolation. We assure him that he ought to be grateful that he has so clear a sense of his loss, for many persons might have lost their pocketbooks and have been quite unable to compute their losses. Our friend is not, however, cheered in the least. No, he says, to know my loss does not help me to recover it. Tell me where I can find my property and you have done me real service. But merely to tell me my loss is no comfort whatever. Even so, to believe that you have sinned, and that your soul is forfeited to the justice of God, is a very proper thing, but it will not save. Salvation is not by our knowing our own ruin, but by fully grasping the deliverance provided in Christ Jesus. A person who refuses to look to the Lord Jesus, but persists in dwelling upon his sin and ruin, reminds us of a boy who dropped a shilling down an open grating of a London sewer and lingered there for hours finding comfort in saying, it rolled in just there, just between those two iron bars. I saw it go right down. Poor soul, 
Long might he remember the details of his loss before he would in this way get back a single penny into his pocket, wherewith to buy himself a piece of bread. You see the drift of the parable? Profit by it. Chapter 2 Jesus Only we cannot too often or too plainly tell the seeking soul that his only hope for salvation lies in the Lord Jesus Christ. It lies in him completely, only, and alone. To save both from the guilt and the power of sin, Jesus is all-sufficient. His name is called Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. The Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. He is exalted on high to give repentance and remission of sins. It pleased God from of old to devise a method of salvation which should be all contained in his only begotten Son. The Lord Jesus, for the working out of this salvation, became man, and being found in fashion as a man became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. If another way of deliverance had been possible, the cup of bitterness would have passed from him. It stands to reason that the darling of heaven would not have died to save us if we could have been rescued at less expense. Infinite grace provided the great sacrifice. Infinite love submitted to death for our sakes. How can we dream that there can be another way than the way which God has provided at such cost and set forth in Holy Scripture so simply and so pressingly? Surely it is true that neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. To suppose that the Lord Jesus has only half saved men, and that there is needed some work or feeling of their own to finish his work, is wicked. What is there of ours that could be added to his blood and righteousness? All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Can these be patched on to the costly fabric of his divine righteousness? Rags and fine white linen, our dross and his pure gold. It is an insult to the Savior to dream of such a thing. We have sinned enough without adding this to all our other offenses. Even if we had any righteousness in which we could boast, if our fig leaves were broader than usual, and were not so utterly fading, it would be wisdom to put them away and accept that righteousness which must be far more pleasing to God than anything of our own. The Lord must see more that is acceptable in His Son than in the best of us. The best of us. The words seem satirical, though they were not so intended. What best is there about any of us? There is none that doeth good, no, not one. I who write these lines would most freely confess that I have not a thread of goodness of my own. I cannot make up so much as a rag or a piece of a rag. I am utterly destitute. But if I had the fairest suit of good works which even pride can imagine, I would tear it up that I might put on nothing but the garments of salvation, which are freely given by the Lord Jesus out of the heavenly wardrobe of his own merits. It is most glorifying to our Lord Jesus Christ that we should hope for every good thing from him alone. This is to treat him as he deserves to be treated. For as he is God, and beside him there is none else, we are bound to look unto him and be saved. This is to treat him as he loves to be treated, for he bids all those who labor and are heavy laden to come to him, and he will give them rest. To imagine that he cannot save to the uttermost is to limit the Holy One of Israel and put a slur upon his power, or else to slander the loving heart of the friend of sinners, and cast it out upon his love. In either case, we should commit a cruel and wanton sin against the tenderest points of his honor, which are his ability and willingness to save all that come unto God by him. The child in danger of the fire just clings to the fireman and trusts to him alone. She raises no question about the strength of his limbs to carry her, or the zeal of his heart to rescue her, but she clings. The heat is terrible. The smoke is blinding, but she clings and her deliverer quickly bears her to safety. In the same childlike confidence, cling to Jesus, who can and will bear you out of danger from the flames of sin. The nature of the Lord Jesus should inspire us with the fullest confidence, as he is God. He is almighty to save. As he is man, he is filled with all fullness to bless. As he is God and man in one majestic person, he meets man in his creatorship and God in his holiness. The latter is long enough to reach from Jacob prostrate on the earth to Jehovah reigning in heaven. To bring another ladder would be to suppose that he fell to bridge the distance, and this would be grievously to dishonor him. If even to add to his words is to draw a curse upon ourselves, what must it be to pretend to add to himself? Remember that he himself is the way, and to suppose that we must in some manner add to the divine road, 
is to be arrogant enough to think of adding to him. Away with such a notion. Loathe it as you would blasphemy, for in essence it is the worst of blasphemy against the Lord of love. To come to Jesus with a price in our hand would be insufferable pride, even if we had any price that we could bring. What does he need of us? What could we bring if he did need it? Would he sell the priceless blessings of his redemption, that which he wrought out in his own heart's blood? Would he barter it with us for our tears and vows, or for ceremonial observances and feelings and works? He is not reduced to make a market of himself. He will give freely as beseems his royal love, but he that offers a price to him knows not with whom he is dealing, nor how grievously he vexes his free spirit. Empty-handed sinners may have what they will. All that they can possibly need is in Jesus, and he gives it for the asking. But we must believe that he is all in all, and we must not dare to breathe a word about completing what he has finished, or fitting ourselves for what he gives to us as undeserving sinners. The reason why we may hope for forgiveness of sin and life eternal by faith in the Lord Jesus is that God has so appointed He has pledged himself in the gospel to save all who truly trust in the Lord Jesus, and he will never run back from his promise. He is so well pleased with his only begotten Son that he takes pleasure in all who lay hold upon him as their one and only hope. The great God himself has taken hold on him who has taken hold on his Son. He works salvation for all who look for that salvation to the once slain Redeemer. For the honor of his Son he will not allow the man who trusts in him to be ashamed. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life, for the ever-living God is taken unto himself and is given to him to be a partaker of his life. If Jesus only be your trust, ye need not fear but what ye shall effectually be saved, both now and in the day of his appearing. When a man confides, there is a point of union between him and God, and that union guarantees blessing. Faith saves us because it makes us cling to Christ Jesus, and he is one with God, and thus brings us into connection with God. I am told that years ago, above the falls of Niagara, a boat was upset, and two men were being carried down by the current, when persons on the shore managed to float a rope out to them, which rope was seized by them both. One of them held fast to it, and was safely drawn to the bank, but the other, seeing a great log come floating by, unwisely let go the rope, and clung to the great piece of timber, for it was the bigger thing of the two, and apparently better to cling to. Alas, the timber with the man on it went right over the vast abyss, because there was no union between the wood and the shore. The size of the log was no benefit to him who grasped it. It needed a connection with the shore to produce safety. So when a man trusts to his works, or to his prayers, or almsgivings, or to sacraments, or to anything of that sort, He will not be saved, because there is no junction between him and God through Christ Jesus. But faith, though it may seem to be like a slender cord, is in the hand of the great God on the shore side. Infinite power pulls in the connecting line, and thus draws a man from destruction. Oh, the blessedness of faith, because it unites us to God by the Savior, whom he has appointed, even Jesus Christ. Oh, reader, is there not a common sense in this manner? Think it over, and may there soon be a band of union between you and God through your faith in Christ Jesus. Chapter 3 Personal Faith in Jesus There is a wretched tendency among men to leave Christ himself out of the gospel. They might as well leave flour out of bread. Men hear the way of salvation explained and consent to it as being scriptural, and in every way such as suits their case, But they forget that a plan is of no service unless it is carried out, and that in the manner of salvation their own personal faith in the Lord Jesus is essential. A road to York will not take me there. I must travel along it for myself. All the sound doctrine that ever was believed will never save a man unless he puts his trust in the Lord Jesus for himself. Mr. MacDonald asked the inhabitants of the island of St. Kilda how a man must be saved. An old man replied, We shall be saved if we repent and forsake our sins and turn to God. Yes, said a middle-aged female, and with a true heart too. I rejoined a third, and with prayer, and added a fourth, It must be the prayer of the heart. And we must be diligent too, said a fifth, in keeping the commandments. Thus each, having contributed his might, feeling that a very decent creed had been made up, 
They all looked and listened for the preacher's approbation, but they had aroused his deepest pity. He had to begin at the beginning and preach Christ to them. The carnal mind always maps out for itself a way in which self can work and become great, but the Lord's way is quite the reverse. The Lord Jesus puts it very compactly in Mark 16, verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Believing and being baptized are no manners of merit to be gloried in. They are so simple that both sin is excluded, and free grace bears the palm. This way of salvation is chosen that it might be seen to be of grace alone. It may be that the reader is unsaved. What is the reason, do you think, the way of salvation is laid down in a text we have quoted to be dubious? Do you fear that you would not be saved if you followed it? How can that be when God has pledged his own word for its certainty? How can that fail which God prescribes and concerning which he gives a promise? Do you think it very easy? Why then do you not attend to it? Its ease leaves those without excuse who neglect it. If you would have done something great, be not so foolish as to neglect this little thing. To believe is to trust, or to lean upon Christ Jesus. In other words, to give up self-reliance and to rely upon the Lord Jesus. To be baptized is to submit to the ordinance which our Lord fulfilled at Jordan, to which the converted one submitted at Pentecost, to which the jailer yielded obedience on the very night of his conversion. It is the outward confession which should always go with inward faith. The outward sign doesn't say, but it sets forth to us our death, burial, and resurrection with Jesus, and like the Lord's Supper, it is not to be neglected. The great point is to believe in Jesus and confess your faith. Do you believe in Jesus? Then, dear friend, dismiss your fears. You shall be saved. Are you still an unbeliever? Then remember, there is but one door, and if you will not enter by it, you must perish in your sins. The door is there. But unless you enter by it, what is the use of it to you? It is of necessity that you obey the command of the gospel. Nothing can save you if you do not hear the voice of Jesus and do his bidding and deed and of a truth. Thinking and resolving will not answer the purpose. You must come to real business, for only as you actually believe will you truly live to God. I heard of a friend who deeply desired to be the means of the conversion of a young man, and one said to him, You may go to him and talk to him, but you will get him no further, for he is exceedingly well acquainted with the plan of salvation. It was eminently so, and therefore when our friend began to speak with the young man, he received for an answer, I am much obliged to you, but I do not know that you can tell me much, for I have long known and admired the plan of salvation by the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. Alas, he was resting in the plan, but he had not believed in the person. The plan of salvation is most blessed, but it can avail us nothing unless we personally believe in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. What is the comfort of a plan of a house if you do not enter the house itself? What is the good of a plan of clothing if you have not a rag to cover you? Have you never heard of the Arab chief at Cairo, who was very ill, and went to the missionary, and the missionary said he could give him a prescription? He did so, and a week after he found the Arab none the better. Did you take my prescription, he asked. Yes, I ate every morsel of the paper. He dreamed that he was going to be cured by devouring a physician's writing, which I may call the plan of the medicine. He should have had the prescription made up, and then it might have wrought him good. If he had taken the draught, it could do him no good to swallow the recipe. So is it with salvation. It is not the plan of salvation which can save, It is a carrying out of that plan by the Lord Jesus and his death on our behalf, and our acceptance of the same. Under the Jewish law, the offerer brought a bullock and laid his hands upon it. It was no dream or theory or plan. In a victim for sacrifice, he found something substantial, which he could handle and touch. Even so do we lean upon the real and true work of Jesus, the most substantial thing under heaven. We come to the Lord Jesus by faith and say, God has provided an atonement here and I accept it. I believe in the fact accomplished on the cross. I am confident that sin was put away by Christ and I rest on him. If you would be saved, you must get beyond the acceptance of plans and doctrines to a resting in the divine person and finish work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear reader, 
Will you have Christ now? Jesus invites all of those who labor and are heavy laden to come to him, and he will give them rest. He does not promise this to their merely dreaming about him. They must come, and they must come to him, and not merely to the church, to baptism, or to the orthodox faith, or to anything short of his divine person. When the brazen serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, the people were not to look to Moses, nor to the tabernacle, nor to the pillar of cloud, but to the brazen serpent itself. Looking was not enough unless they looked to the right object, and the right object was not enough unless they looked. It was not enough for them to know about the serpent of brass. They must each one look to it for himself. When a man is ill, he may have a good knowledge of medicine, and yet he may die if he does not actually take the healing draught. We must receive Jesus, for to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Lay the emphasis on two words, we must receive him, and we must receive him. We must open wide the door and take Christ Jesus in, for Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ must be no myth, no dream, no phantom to us, but a real man and truly God, and our reception of him must not be forced and feigned acceptance, but the hearty and happy assent, and consent of the soul that he shall be the all in all of our salvation. Will we not at once come to him and make him our soul trust? The dove is haunted by the hawk, and finds no security from its restless enemy. It has learned that there is shelter for it in the cleft of the rock, and it hastens there with gladsome wing. Once wholly sheltered within its refuge, it fears no bird of prey. But if it did not hide itself in the rock, it would be seized upon by its adversary. The rock would be of no use to the dove, if the dove did not enter its cleft. The whole body must be hidden in the rock. What if ten thousand other birds found a fortress there? Yet that fact would not save the one dove which is now pursued by the hawk. It must put its whole self into the shelter, and bury itself within its refuge, or its life will be forfeited to the destroyer. What a picture of faith is this. It is entering into Jesus, hiding in his wounds. Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. The dove is out of sight. The rock alone is seen. So does a guilty soul dart into the riven side of Jesus by faith, and is buried in him out of sight of avenging justice. But there must be this personal application to Jesus for shelter. And this it is that so many put off from day to day, till it is to be feared that they will die in their sins. What an awful word is that. It is what our Lord said to the unbelieving Jews, and he says the same to us at this hour. If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. It makes one's heart quiver to think that even one shall read these lines that may yet be of the miserable company who will thus perish. The Lord prevent it of his great grace. I saw the other day a remarkable picture which I shall use as an illustration of the way of salvation by faith in Jesus. An offender had committed a crime for which he must die. But it was in the olden time when churches were considered to be sanctuaries in which criminals might hide themselves and so escape from death. See the transgressor? He rushes towards the church. The guards pursue him with their drawn swords, a thirst for his blood. They follow him even to the church door. He rushes up the steps and just as they are about to overtake him and hew him in pieces on the threshold of the church, out comes the bishop and holding up the cross, he cries, Back, back! Stain not the precincts of God's house with blood. Stand back. The fierce soldiers at once respect the emblem and retire, while the poor fugitive hides himself behind the robes of the bishop. It is even so with Christ. The guilty sinner flies straight away to Jesus, and though justice pursues him, Christ lifts up his wounded hands and cries to justice, Stand back. I shelter the sinner. In the secret place of my tabernacle do I hide him. I will not allow him to perish, for he puts his trust in me. Sinner, fly to Christ. But you answer, I am too vile. The viler you are, the more will you honor him by believing that he is able to protect even you. But I am so great a sinner. Then the more honor shall be given to him if you have faith to confide in him. 
great sinner though you are. If you have a little sickness and you tell your physician, Sir, I'm quite confident in your skill to heal, there is no great compliment in your declaration. Anybody can cure a finger ache or a trifling sickness. But if you are sore sick with a complication of diseases which grievously torment you, and you say, Sir, I seek no better physician, I will ask no other advice but yours, I trust myself joyfully with you, what an honor have you conferred on him, that you can trust your life in his hands while it is in extreme and immediate danger. Do the like with Christ. Put your soul into his care. Do it deliberately and without a doubt. Dare to quit all other hopes. Venture all on Jesus. I say venture, though there is nothing really venturesome in it. For he is abundantly able to save. Cast yourself simply on Jesus. Let nothing but faith be in your soul towards Jesus. Believe him and trust in him. And you shall never be ashamed of your confidence. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. 1 Peter 2 verse 6 Chapter 4 Faith Very Simple To many, faith seems a hard thing. The truth is, it is only hard because it is easy. Naaman thought it hard that he should have to wash in Jordan. But if it had been some great thing, he would have done it right cheerfully. People think that salvation must be the result of some act of feeling, very mysterious and very difficult. God's thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are his ways our ways. In order that the feeblest and the most ignorant may be saved, he has made the way of salvation as easy as the A, B, C. There is nothing about it to puzzle anyone, only as everybody expects to be puzzled by it. Many are quite bewildered when they find it to be so exceedingly simple. The fact is, we do not believe that God means what he is saying. We act as if it could not be true. I have heard of a Sunday school teacher who performed an experiment which I do not think I shall ever try with children, for it might turn out to be a very expensive one. Indeed, I feel sure that the result in my case would be very different from what I now describe. This teacher had been trying to illustrate what faith was, and as he could not get it into the minds of his boys, he took his watch, and he said, Now I will give you this watch, John. Will you have it? John fell thinking what the teacher could mean and did not seize the treasure, but made no answer. The teacher said to the next boy, Henry, here is the watch, will you have it? The boy, with a very proper modesty, replied, No, thank you, sir. The teacher tried several of the boys with the same result, till at last a youngster, who was not so wise or so thoughtful as the others, but rather more believing, said in the most natural way, Thank you, sir, and put the watch into his pocket. Then the other boys woke up to a startling fact. Their companion had received a watch which they had refused. One of the boys quickly asked of the teacher, Is he to keep it? Of course he is, said the teacher. I offered it to him and he accepted it. I would not give a thing and take a thing. That would be very foolish. I put the watch before you and said that I gave it to you, but none of you would have it. Oh, said the boy, if I had known you meant it, I would have had it. Of course he would. He thought it was a piece of acting and nothing more. All the other boys were in a dreadful state of mind to think that they had lost a watch. Each one cried, Teacher, I did not know you meant it, but I thought. No one took the gift, but everyone thought. Each one had his theory except a simple-minded boy who believed what he was told and got the watch. Now I wish that I could always be such a simple child as literally to believe what the Lord says and take what he puts before me, resting quite content that he is not playing with me, and that I cannot be wrong in accepting what he sets before me in the gospel. Happy should we be if we would trust and raise no questions of any sort. But alas, we will get thinking and doubting. When the Lord uplifts his dear son before a sinner, that sinner should take him without hesitation. If you take him, you have him, and none can take him from you. Out with your hand, man, and take him at once. When inquirers accept the Bible as literally true, and see that Jesus is really given to all who trust him, all the difficulty about understanding the way of salvation vanishes like the morning's frost at the rising of the sun. Two inquiring ones came to me in my vestry. They had been hearing the gospel from me for only a short season, but they had been deeply impressed by it. They expressed their regret that they were about to remove far away, 
but they added their gratitude that they had heard me at all. I was cheered by their kind thanks, but felt anxious that a more effectual work should be wrought in them, and therefore I asked him, Have you in very deed believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you saved? One of them replied, I have been trying hard to believe. This statement I have often heard, but I will never let it go by me unchallenged. No, I said, that will not do. Did you ever tell your father that you tried to believe him? After I dwelt a while upon the matter, they admitted that such language would have been an insult to their father. I then set the gospel very plainly before them in as simple language as I could, and begged them to believe Jesus, who is more worthy of faith than the best of fathers. One of them replied, I cannot realize it. I cannot realize that I am saved. Then I went on to say, God bears testimony to his son that whoever trusts in his son is saved. Will you make him a liar now? Or will you believe his word? While I thus spoke, one of them started as if astonished, and she startled us all as she cried, Oh, sir, I see it all. I am saved. Oh, do bless Jesus for me. He has shown me the way, and he has saved me. I see it all. The esteemed sister who had brought these young friends to me knelt down with them while, with all our hearts we blessed and magnified the Lord for a soul brought into light. One of the two sisters, however, could not see the gospel as the other had done, though I feel sure she will do so before long. Did it not seem strange that both hearing the same words, one should come out into clear light and the other should remain in the gloom? The change which comes over the heart when the understanding grasps the gospel is often reflected in the face and shines there like the light of heaven. Such newly enlightened souls often exclaim, Why, sir, it is so plain. How is it I have not seen it before this? I understand all I have read in the Bible now, though I could not make it out before. It has all come in a minute, and now I see that I could never understand before. The fact is the truth was always plain, but they were looking for signs and wonders, and therefore did not see what was near them. Old men often look for their spectacles when they are on their foreheads, and it is commonly observed that we fail to see that which is straight before us. Christ Jesus is before our faces, and we have only to look to him and live. But we make all manner of bewilderment of it, and so manufacture a maze out of that which is plain as a pike staff. The little incident about the two sisters reminds me of another. A much esteemed friend came to me one Sabbath morning after service to shake hands with me. For, said she, I was fifty years old on the same day as yourself. I am like you in that one thing, sir, but I am the very reverse of you in better things. I remarked, then you must be a very good woman, for in many things I wish I also could be the reverse of what I am. No, no, she said. I did not mean anything of that sort. I am not right at all. What? I cried. Are you not a believer in the Lord Jesus? Well, she said with much emotion, I, I will try to be. I laid hold of her hand and said, My dear soul, you are not going to tell me that you will try to believe my Lord Jesus. I cannot have such talk from you. It means blank unbelief. What has he done that you should talk of him in that way? Would you tell me that you would try to believe me? I know you would not treat me so rudely. You think me a true man, and so you believe me at once. And surely you cannot do less with my Lord Jesus. Then with tears she exclaimed, Oh, sir, do pray for me. To this I replied, I do not feel that I can do anything of the kind. What can I ask the Lord Jesus to do for one who will not trust him? I see nothing to pray about. If you will believe him, you shall be saved. And if you will not believe him, I cannot ask him to invent a new way to gratify your unbelief. Then she said again, I will try to believe. But I told her solemnly, I would have none of her trying. For the message from the Lord did not mention trying, but said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I pressed upon her the great truth that he that believeth on him has everlasting life. And his terrible reverse, he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I urged her to full faith in the once crucified, but now ascended Lord, and the Holy Spirit there and then enabled her to trust. She most tenderly said, O oh, sir, I have been looking to my feelings, and this has been my mistake. Now I trust my soul with Jesus, and I am saved. She found immediate peace through believing. There is no other way. 
God has been pleased to make the necessities of life very simple manners. We must eat, and even a blind man can find a way to his mouth. We must drink, and even the tiniest babe knows how to do this without instruction. We have a fountain in the grounds of the Stockwell Orphanage, and when it is running in the hot weather, the boys go to it naturally. We have no class for fountain drill. Many poor boys have come to the orphanage, but never one who was so ignorant that he did not know how to drink. Now faith is, in spiritual things, what eating and drinking are in temporal things. By the mouth of faith, we take the blessings of grace into our spiritual nature, and they are ours. O oh, you who would believe, but think you cannot, do you not see that, as one can drink without strength, and as one can eat without strength, and get strength by eating, so we may receive Jesus without effort, and by accepting him we receive power for all such further effort as we may be called to put forth? Faith is so simple a manner that, whenever I try to explain it, I am very fearful lest I should becloud its simplicity. When Thomas Scott had printed his notes upon the Pilgrim's Progress, he asked one of his parishioners whether she understood the book. Oh, yes, sir, said she. I understand Mr. Bunyan well enough, and I am hoping that one day, by divine grace, I may understand your explanations. Should I not feel mortified if my reader should know what faith is, and then get confused by my explanation? I will, however, make one trial, and pray the Lord to make it clear. I am told that on a certain highland road, there was a disputed right of way. The owner wished to preserve his supremacy, and at the same time he did not wish to inconvenience the public. Hence an arrangement which occasioned the following incident. Seeing a sweet country girl standing at the gate, a tourist went up to her and offered her a shilling to permit him to pass. No, no, said the child. I must not take anything from you. But you were to say, please allow me to pass, and then you may come through and welcome. The permission was to be asked for, but it could be had for the asking. Just so, eternal life is free, and it can be had, yea, it shall be at once had by trusting in the word of him who cannot lie. Trust Christ, and by that trust you grasp salvation and eternal life. Do not philosophize. Do not sit down and bother your poor brain. Just believe Jesus as you would believe your father. Trust him as you trust your money with a banker, or your health with a doctor. Faith will not long seem a difficulty to you, nor ought it to be so, for it is simple. Faith is trusting, trusting wholly upon the person, work, merit, and power of the Son of God. Some think this trusting is a romantic business, but indeed it is the simplest thing that can possibly be. To some of us, truths which were once hard to believe and are now manners of fact which we should find it hard to doubt. If one of our great-grandfathers were to rise from the dead, and come into the present state of things, what a deal of trusting he would have to do. He would say tomorrow morning, Where are the flint and steel? I want a light. And we should give him a little box with tiny pieces of wood in it, and tell him to strike one of them on the box. He would have to trust a good deal before he would believe the fire would thus be produced. We should next say to him, Now that you have a light, turn that tap and light the gas. He sees nothing. How can light come through an invisible vapor? And yet it does. Come with us, grandfather. Sit in that chair. Look at that box in front of you. You shall have your lightness directly. No, child, he would say, it is ridiculous. The sun, take my portrait? I cannot believe it. Yes, and you shall ride fifty miles in an hour without horses. He will not believe it till we get him into the train. My dear sir, you shall speak to your son in New York, and he shall answer you in a few minutes. Should we not astonish the old gentleman? Would he not want all his faith? Yet these things are believed by us without effort, because experience has made us familiar with them. Faith is greatly needed by you who are strangers to spiritual things. You seem lost while we are talking about them. But oh, how simple it is to us who have the new life and have communion with spiritual realities. We have a Father to whom we speak, and He hears us, and a blessed Savior who hears our heart's longings and helps us in our struggles against sin. It is all plain to Him that understands. May it now be plain to you. You have listened to the first four chapters of a book, Around the Wicked Gate, by C. H. Spurgeon.